Happy Thursday and welcome back to the Locked On Red Sox podcast. Thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. I am your host, Jake Inazuski, or Iggy for short. And I'm also joined by my co-host, Nesson writer, Lauren Campbell. Lauren and I had the opportunity to interview Red Sox minor leaguer, Zach Kelly, and talk to him a little bit about what it was like to play for a Division II baseball team and get signed after being undrafted by the Oakland A's for $500. We also talked to him a little bit about what it was like having a UCL tear in 2020 and how that surgery sort of changed how he pitched. And we also touched on as well how he signed with the Red Sox on a minor league contract. This is part one of the Zach Kelly interview, so I hope you enjoy it, but also make sure to check out tomorrow's episode for part two. Now let's get into Lauren and I's conversation with Red Sox minor leaguer, Zach Kelly. You are locked on Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am here with Red Sox minor leaguer, Zach Kelly. So how are we doing today, Zach? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, Chapin, South Carolina. Oh, there you go. How's the weather down there? Uh, it's good. It's about it's in the 60s. I think it's going to start to get a little colder, but you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't get too cold down here. Oh, there we go. We're, we're up. Uh, I'm, I'm in New Hampshire. And uh, it's funny enough, even though it snowed like two or three days ago, it's actually like 50 degrees the past few days. It's kind of weird. Yeah, we don't uh, we don't get much snow down here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, wh- where did you uh, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Roanoke, Virginia. So um, my parents house is actually about 15 minutes from the uh, ballpark in Salem. Uh, and so I know I, you know, I grew up going to those games all the time. Uh, and so I grew up there, um, went to high school there. And then, uh, so I haven't really been back there full time since I graduated high school. Makes sense. And so what, what was sort of your favorite team growing up? Uh, I, I was a Braves fan growing up. So we had TBS and so the Braves were on all the time. Uh, and I think, the Nationals weren't there until I think I got into, you know, later into elementary school, if I remember correctly. And so, uh, you know, everybody was pretty much a Braves fan uh, in that area. And then once the Nationals came to came around, you kind of had a little bit of a split. But uh, and a lot of guy, a lot of people stuck with the Braves. Makes sense. You you must have been psyched. You, even even though you obviously play for the Red Sox right now, you must have been psyched this past season. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it was cool because. Um, I, I watched all the Red Sox games until uh, until they got knocked out, and so I didn't really, you know, I didn't really pay attention too much to the other teams. But once they got knocked out, uh, I, I was definitely definitely happy to see the Braves win it. Um, you know, because just growing growing up and just watching watching them, going to a lot of their games and seeing a lot of their postseason runs kind of end shortly. Growing up, uh, you know, it was good to see them finally finally get get it done and win. Makes sense. Did you have any players growing up watching the Braves or even the Nationals that you tried to kind of emulate or mirror your game after? Uh, not really. You know, I've always really kind of um, kind of followed some different players, but I kind of try to take you know a little bit a little bit of stuff just from kind of each one of them. I think probably growing up, my favorite pitcher was was Verlander. Uh, you know, I didn't really think that I emulated him too much, obviously, but uh, just watching him compete and watching him do the stuff that he did. Uh, early in his career, I mean, shoot, still, still in his career today, uh, okay. it's just really fun to watch. Um, but my favorite player growing up was was Chipper Jones. Uh, he, Love it. you know, because I I was a hitter a lot in my life until I kind of got to college, and so he was really my favorite player. Uh, you know, we whenever he got his jersey retired in Atlanta, we went down for that. So that was for me. You know, as a kid, that was awesome. That's awesome. You said that you were mainly a hitter growing up. So like. How did you sort of make the decision to, uh, you know, transition to only focusing on pitching and and, and also as well, like um, only being a bullpen arm? 
Yeah, well, it was a lot easier because the decision was kind of made for me. Um, oh, okay. But, you know, I loved hitting because, uh, I mean, we didn't really have any of these little academies or, you know, facilities where you could go really get pitching instruction. So I, you know, me and my buddies, we all just went and hit all the time and kind of took stuff from each other. And, uh, you know, I, I pretty much pitched because I had to in high school. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I could tell where the ball was going and I could throw it in the strike zone. So for where I grew up in high school, that was good enough. Uh, but uh, so I was, I always felt like I was a better hitter than I was a pitcher. And then, once I got to, I, mean, I originally went to, to college to, to do both, and I was an outfielder and a pitcher. And then after my freshman year of winter break and getting into my, my freshman season, I made the rotation as our um, our number four starter. And so uh, I just kind of moved on to that full time. But, yeah, it was definitely an easier transition when the decision was made for me than, uh, <laughs> than me having to do it. But, um even, you know, in college, I was a starter. Um, even, you know, going into pro ball, a lot of my appearances were relief appearances, but, you know, they were piggyback or tandem starts. And so I would start with throw three or four, and I would come in for three or four, and then we'd give it to the bullpen. But I didn't really transition to a full-time, you know, bona fide bullpen role until this year. Makes sense. Was that transition easy for you being like how your kind of collegiate career went? Like, was that an easy transition or was it more like a back and forth? Like, how am I going to do this? Yeah. I, you know, I definitely wasn't thrilled about it at first because I, you know, I, I always been a star. It's really the only mentality that I've had. Uh, but, you know, once I, we kind of sat down and, you know, they told me that I was going to go to the bullpen, you know, I, I didn't really have a choice. It's kind of a, you know, a sink or swim moment. So, you know, I decided to kind of take that situation head on, and um, you know, we had we had some guys in Portland that you know were that were full time bullpen roles, and you know, a lot of it was to kind of having conversations with with Tyler Olson. You know, he's an older guy; he's he's been in the big leagues before, and so he has his routine down. And uh, you know, routines get changed all the time, and so you know, a lot of these guys know what works and what doesn't work, and how they get prepared the best. Um, and so I kind of had to make my own, you know, just from a daily basis of you know, what I needed to get ready or, you know, days that I had a feeling that I was going to throw, how I prepared versus the day after I, I threw, how I prepared that day in case I had to go in because, you know, it doesn't happen a ton in the minor leagues, but going back to back is something that you have to be ready for and, and to do because mm -hmm. in the big leagues, it happens all the time. And so I think for me, that, that was the, you know, the biggest thing was trying to get that routine down. And once you get your routine down, everything else kind of falls into place. Um, um, but yeah, I want, I got, once I got in there and kind of went through a couple different roles, I really liked it. I kind of, you know, I, I forced myself to buy in and after those initial kind of negative thoughts got out of my head about it and I just accepted the fact that I was a reliever, it kind of, it kind of took off from there. Makes sense. I, I haven't really honestly thought about like that, the whole routine is, especially with, um, you know, most relievers staying out there for, um, especially sitting down into the bullpen for, you know, could be like six to seven innings, but you, you were a guy as a starter who, who knew that you were going to start one day and was able to prepare before the game. And so sort of how was that transition, um, especially having to warm up so quickly if, if they need you immediately? Right. You nailed it on the head. So as a starter, you know, I know exactly when I'm throwing. And so, um, so I know when I'm throwing and I, for a seven o'clock game, I go out there at six 30, I throw, I go straight from the line to the mound and, uh, you know, I'm going, but as a reliever, you're, you know, you're going out there at two o'clock, three o'clock. And then if your name gets called, it's not going to be until nine or nine, you know, eight thirty, nine o'clock at night. And so mm -hmm. when your name, you know, you're doing, I mean, you're doing stuff, uh, in between innings, you kind of feel out the situation, but you know, you're still not throwing for seven, seven to eight hours. And so when, you know, you, your name gets called, you might have the next hitter, you might have a couple of hitters to get ready. And so, you know, there's been times where I've thrown four or five pitches in the bullpen and I'm in the game. And there's also been times where, you know, I've thrown 15 to 20 and, and not gotten in the game. And so you, even if you throw those 15 to 20 and you don't get in, you know, you're still expecting to be ready for the, the next night. And so that's what it, you know, that's where it goes into more of a, you know, arm care stuff and doing what you need to do after the, after the game to make sure you're ready for the next day. And, 
the lifting schedule is different too. Or you know, the Red Sox we have our relievers kind of doing a little bit of a little bit of something every day. Where as a starter, you you know you lift, you know you lift two days, two or three days a week, and so every you know everything is different. It's a whole it's, it's a whole new position. It's a whole whole new transition. But uh, I'm glad I'm glad it went as well as it did for me. I hope you guys are enjoying our conversation with Red Sox minor leaguer Zach Kelly. But I just want to take a second to talk to you about Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered all season, more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues the march to the playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head on to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit just use our promo code locked on to receive your bonus from basketball football nhl boxing and ufc right to your favorite vegas casino games don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season bet online is your fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite sports bet online where the game starts and I also wanted to take a second to talk to you about stance. I've really been enjoying the stance items and how comfortable and colorful everything is. The apparel is very well made, super soft, entirely unique. It's a lot of fun to wear as well. And I'm really looking forward to purchasing more for myself, especially during this holiday season. Stance gives you a sense of confidence and simply by feeling good. Stance was founded in 2009, and the apparel brand represents a radical reinvention of socks, underwear, and active apparel with a sharp focus on comfort, quality, and creativity. Stance brings an atypical aesthetic alongside some of pop culture's hottest collaborations for the ultimate in style and self-expression, because everything you wear should be a direct extension of who you are and how you feel. Stance believes that the perfect fit matters more than fitting in. And one of my favorite collaborations that they have had is with The Office, Major League Baseball, NBA, and some of my favorites is Pixar. I don't know about you guys, but I always love myself some Pixar. That and those who feel good do good. Go see for yourself. Register for an account at stance.com and get 15% off your first purchase. Use promo code locked on at checkout to apply. Enjoy the color and comfort of the life less extraordinary with stance. Now let's get back to Lauren and I's conversation with Red Sox minor leaguer Zach Kelly. 100%. Definitely. And you were a D2 ball player. You went undrafted out of college until you were ultimately signed um, by the A's for $500. But being the, the D2 player, and going into professional ball, did you ever have some, some sort of chip on your shoulder, kind of like, I belong in the big leagues, I belong, I am a professional ball player? Yeah, um, yeah I've always thought that, told myself that, you know, I thought I was, you know, good enough to compete at that level. Uh, I didn't really have a chance to until um, the summer after my sophomore year, I played in the Coastal Plains League, and um you know, there's guys from you know North Carolina and Florida and Texas, and you know, you're going head to head against those guys. And then, like, once you kind of get get past all that, you know, it's you know it's a competition between you and another guy, to, you know, regardless of what school he goes to. And um, but yeah, I I definitely do, just because, like you said, you know, coming into pro ball, it's you know, where'd you go to school? And it's, you know, Texas Tech or south carolina florida state and then they ask you where you went and you got to say newberry college and you kind of get the same reaction it's like oh well okay and usually they say where is that at and i just say ah, not too far from south carolina but um i definitely had a chip on my shoulder just because i you know i wanted to prove that i belonged you know i because I, whenever i was getting getting scouted it was really hard just because you know, there's only, only so many schools that they can go to. And, you know, when I would start on a Friday night, it, you know, it ultimately came down to a decision of these scouts, whether, you know, they want to go 30 minutes down the road to, you know, South Carolina to watch a SEC game on a Friday night or go mm -hmm. up to Clemson and, or they want to go to Newberry college. And so I kind of had to do this, what I feel is like a little bit extra to get my name out there and try to get them to come to 
you know, to, to Newberry College on a Friday night rather than to Clemson or South Carolina. Um, but, you know, I think kind of once you get into pro ball and, you know, kind of after like the first couple of weeks or months, you know, the, the, the round you got picked in or the school you got picked, you got picked from kind of goes away a little bit. And then it's just like, well, okay, that's, that's great what you did, but you know, what are you, what are you doing now? And so that's kind of the, the way I've kind of tried to, tried to go about it. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's a good mindset for me to have. And it's, it's been going well for me so far. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's the perfect mindset. You know, we, we sometimes see these players who, you know, come out of big schools or, or a, you know, top pick with the, with these big heads and, you know, they, they expect to be tra- treated in a, in a certain or special way, but you said it perfectly. It, it's not about what you did before. It's what you're doing right now. Yeah. I, you know, there's only been a handful of undrafted free agents to make it to the big leagues. And so I'm just trying to make it, make it one more. One thousand percent. And talk a little bit about how you found out that you were being signed by the Oakland A's. I, I bet it was sort of kind of cool for you, you know, thinking thinking back on, on the movie Moneyball with Billy Bean being such a genius. Uh, but you, like like Lauren said before, you were signed for five hundred dollars, and and so after taxes, I I can't even imagine how little money that is. And um, what was your reaction about that? It was funny. Um... So I'll kind of go from the start with draft day. It's really, it was kind of, I was, I was really embarrassed to be honest. So I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what to expect because I didn't have an agent at the time because, you know, I, I thought I might have a chance to play, but it wasn't for sure. And so I wasn't going to kind of go out of my way and, you know, division two guy, senior, you know, I'm not sitting here. I don't really need anybody to kind of push for me just because, you know, as a senior, you're not, you're only going to get what you're, what you're going to get. You're not going to, you don't, you don't have any leverage. And so you're not going to be sitting there asking for, for more money. And so I didn't really need an agent or an advisor. Um, but you know, we went, we went up to my parents' house. So it was me and me and them. And then, um, my wife now, she was my girlfriend at the time, but, um, I had a couple of teams interested and, uh, I didn't really know, and there's a couple teams that you know that said we're going to take you, at, you know, as a senior sign and at the, in the top ten, which you see a lot because they'll try to get their first six or seven picks for a lot of money, and then kind of use the rest of their their very little bonus pool for some seniors, you know, eight, nine, and ten. So I thought I had a chance to go there, but I didn't really hear anything on day two, uh, so that was out the window. And then you know, a couple teams have said something about you know what you know what you signed for. For senior for senior money on day three and i said yeah absolutely but the rounds just kept going and, <laughs> and kept going i didn't I, my phone was saying you know clear i didn't really get any any texts any calls until about the 30 30th round and my um my contact with the a's and my a scout his name is neil avent great guy he said well, you know, i think we're gonna, i think we're going to take you here in 32 so I got I got all ready, you know, turned the TV on, MLB Network, got got ready to go, and ultimately it wasn't my name. And then so I texted him and I said, "What happened?" And he's like, "We're going to take you. We're going to take you." I think not until about the thirty seventh or thirty eighth round is when he texted me and said, "I think we're going to take some high school kids." I pushed for you, and so at that point I thought, you know, I thought I, I didn't have a chance, but I think it was probably 15, 20 minutes after the draft was when you know he called me and said, "You know, we'll take you for a free agent deal." for you know five hundred dollars and i don't think i've ever said yes quicker um <laughs> so I, it was five hundred dollars and you know i went out there and then like yeah what you said after taxes was three hundred and twenty three dollars and i looked to my right and those uh our fourth rounder i think i think he had over three hundred and twenty three thousand so that was a very humbling <laughs> experience to say the least <laughs> yeah i can i can only imagine and uh you know, what, what did you sort of do with that $300? Because it's, it's not like you're going to go out there and, um, you know, you know spend, spend a ton of it. Yeah, well, I had to I had to pay $300 of rent the day after. Um, so, yeah, I had to go cash it, take the $300 out, and then I took the other 23 and I went and got a two-for-20 from Applebee's. There we um, go. I had to get water because I couldn't I, – I wanted, I wanted to make sure – that I didn't go over the twenty three dollars, and so it, that was that was 
<laughs> that's always a funny story for me to tell. I still tell that story all the time just because, you know, it's funny because I think I, I think I paid to play baseball my my rookie year. Wow. That's hysterical. It's so it's funny to hear that kind of thing because I feel even with all the attention around minor leaguers and the, their pay and how much they make per season that when you bring into this, you're, you're basically what you signed for with the, with the A's and just how crazy that can be like putting that into perspective. Like it was like a signing bonus that almost half of that was taken from you. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's about time uh, that, you know, this, this kind of starts getting out there because this is something that's been happening for a long time. And, you know, I think, I, I think everybody's going to benefit from it because, you know, it's, it's no secret that, you know, you give your, your employees or in this case, your minor leaguers better conditions and, you know, you know, they, I know how they increase the salary. And so, you know, that gives players more money to eat better. It gives them more money to live better, or it doesn't have them to call it. doesn't cause them to have to work 40 hours in the off season per week. You know, they can, you know, they can work half of that and spend more hours training. And so in turn, you know, that allows them to perform better. And when your players perform better, your big league team performs better. And when they right. perform better, you know, you make more money. And so, you know, it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. And I'm just really glad that, you know, MLB and the, the owners and the players have kind of, you know, advocated so much and that this is getting, this is getting done. And I think, you know, we're taking small steps, but you know, the, some of these small steps have been, been due for a while. And so I really like the direction we're headed. I think we're going to keep going with it. And I think you're going to see the product on the field take a huge leap for it. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry. I, I think people, when you, when you say that you sleep better, you eat better, then you perform better. All of a sudden it's a, it's a totally new team, totally new players when you're fueling your body properly. And I think, bringing the attention to the minor leagues and how little their pay is sometimes how not great their conditions are. It was brought to light so much, especially within the last 12 months that it's finally starting to get people talking. It's finally starting to get MLB involved. And like you said, the product becomes better when you treat your, essentially when you treat your employees better, everyone's just happier. The fans are happier. The players are happier and all around. It's a better product on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I get it. You know, I understand, you know, your, your guys and, and rookie ball and low a are not the ones that are sitting there making, you know, making the revenue at Fenway every night. I, you know, I get it. And I don't think it's a, you know, it's a system directed just to not pay people. I think it's just a system that was set up that way from the beginning and no one wanted to, to take the initiative to change it. And so, you know, I, I, completely understand it's not it's not great you know it it wasn't it's not fun to deal with but i understand and so that's why you know it's so it's it's just great to to see that some change starting to happen and you know i hope you know the next two or three years going going forward we kind of can equal up to some of the other sports minor league pay too because i know you know like the g league and the nba or the the echl and the ahl affiliated with the nhl i know that i know what their pay what their pay is and so you know uh, hopefully we're taking strides to kind of to kind of match that yeah i really hope so because it, it was honestly pretty surprising to me i remember when i talked to some minor leaguers uh, a few years ago they, they were saying that they were making you know a thousand dollars a month and they, they were having to work a second job at market basket and i'm like are you kidding me yeah. right now you're like a top prospect and in, in a premier team and uh it, it was even more frustrating during covid you know when we saw uh like 400 500 minor leaguers uh getting released and you know obviously came out with some teams that it, it would cost them just a million dollars to pay all these guys. Yeah. Um, and, and, and unfortunately you were one of the guys who got released uh, during, during COVID-19. Um, and, and how was that experience for you? And um, did, did you kind of feel that similar frustration? Yes and no. Um, it, it was frustrating just, just to see all the teams have to do that really. Um, because I, you know, I kind of felt like it just turned into a financial situation over, 
you know, players that you like. Because I know a lot of the guys that got released with me with the Angels had re really good years in, in the upper minors in 2019. And so, you know, results-wise, it didn't make sense for them to get released. If it was a normal year, based on what they did the year before, they wouldn't have gotten released. And mm -hmm. so I think that's when it turned into, a, you know, a financial situation, which, you know, I, it was, I wasn't the one being affected by that financially. So, you know, I, I can't really speak for, for them. But for me personally, though, you know, at the time I was, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty upset about it. I was not really upset, but just kind of, I don't really know how to describe it, but at the end of the day, I kind of, I kind of understood because I came in, you know, I was, I don't know, probably 24, 25 at the time. And, you know, I called him and told him I needed elbow surgery. I had, I got diagnosed with a kind of like a torn UCL in spring training. And then, you know, when, when that happened, I had seven weeks until, until, you know, the season started. And so, I just tried to rehab it and then everybody got sent home. And so that kind of threw a wrench in everything. And uh, so from, you know, middle of March until the end of May, I was trying to rehab and rehab. And, you know, once I got to anything, I really, you know, 75, 80%, I could just tell it wasn't right. Um, and so, you know, if there, there was anything I was going to do, then it wasn't, it wasn't going to be able to happen how my elbow was at the time. And so, uh, you know, I told him I wanted surgery and then, I got released, which you know, was pretty, I don't know how to really describe like the feeling that I had just because I was, I was almost just like shocked more than any, more than anything. Um, but you know, from, so from my side, that's how, how it is. But from their side, it's like, okay, you know, we have a, an older guy that is not going to be able to help us this year because there's no season and he's not going to be able to help us next year because he's going to be rehabbing an arm surgery. Right. And so I understood that it wasn't, it really wasn't worth it for them. You know, fortunately for me, the, the diagnosis that I originally got was not as severe as the one that I got, you know, in June of last year. And so I was able to come, to come back, but that, you know, that was just the reality of the situation at the time. And so, you know, in the moment I was, I was a little, little upset about it, but, you know, looking back now, I completely understood. And with everything you went through undergoing the surgery, um, how you, you kind of talked about your recovery, how as a whole was the recovery and did the surgery change how you went about pitching? Did your kind of form change at all or anything like that? Yeah. You know, it, it honestly couldn't have went any better. Um, you know, I went down to, I, it kind of gave me a choice to where I wanted to get my surgery at. And so I went to, I immediately went to Dr. Andrews and, and, went went to the best um dr dugas down there he took care of me and during like all my research and stuff i found out that there's another surgery where they you know they put a essentially put a, a brace on your ucl and so there, and it's only like a specific case for it where if hmm. you know if the ligament is kind of torn in the middle then you can't do it but if it's kind of pulled off the bone you know you're more likely to be able to get it and so i went down there to him and, and with my you know with you know, the kind of pre-surgery conversation and so I looked, this is what I want in my a candidate for it. And he went and looked at it and he said, yeah, I was. And so, uh, that's what I got. And so essentially what that did was kind of cut my recovery time down in half. Um, and so, you know, I got my surgery on June 25th and I started playing catch on September 1st. Wow. And so, you know, it was very, very short. Whereas if I was going to get a full blown Tommy John, I probably wouldn't have been thrown for another, you know, six, seven months after the surgery. Um, right. And so from there, you know, I was able to get off the mound in November. And then um, I, I came and threw, I threw a bullpen for, for Boston in December. And, you know, that's, you know, we went, we went from there, but, you know, it couldn't, have, it couldn't have went any better. And I think it just kind of humbled me a little bit because like, you know, I had to kind of sit down and really like, self-reflect on you know how I, I didn't take care of my body and my arm as well as i should have and um, it almost kind of gave me a second chance to to start doing that and i didn't you know i noticed that i was just i, I worked really hard I, it was during covid and so uh, luckily my gym was open but nothing really else really was and so you know all i really had to do was go to the gym and stuff uh, and so i really tried to take care of my body and you know, just kind of research pitching a little bit and just researching mechanics and watching videos of, 
you know, guys in the big leagues like DeGrom and Scherzer and Verlander and guys like that and just, like, kind of see some similarities with those guys and kind of just try to understand why they do why they do what they do. And mm-hmm. so I think mechanically I, I definitely cleaned that up a little bit and realized some inefficiencies that I had with my – with my body and kind of tried to hammer those in, but it really, it really did kind of give me a, a second chance and allow me to clean a lot of stuff up. I'm happy to hear, you know, the whole recovery went well. And, you know, like you said, th- thank God you were able to get that, you know, secondary surgery. So you were able to have, um, you know, the exceptional season that you had this past year. But um, you mentioned that you, that you threw a bullpen for the Red Sox and during that free agency period, um, what really intrigued you to, to sign with the Sox? Uh, I think just, you know, a lot of it was the history, um, just, you know, the history of, you know, not even necessarily just being a big market team, but, you know, the success that they've had and, you know, that how first class the organization is. And you know, I was able to, to have a, a couple different conversations with a couple different people and, you know, everything that I was looking for kind of lined up with them. Uh, you know, there was a couple different teams interested uh, at the time, but, you know, I just didn't get the same feeling when, when those teams called me as I did when the Red Sox called me. And so, that's cool. you know, I kind of instinctually just understood that, you know, that's where my, my mind was kind of looking, to, looking towards and, you know, it, everything kind of fell into place. You know, it was, uh, I remember for a couple of years back when I was a, when I was a kid playing travel ball, I wore number 58 because of Jonathan Papelbon. I, I just it. loved the way he threw and, uh, <laughs> it was, he was just fun to watch for me. And so, can't forget about the stare. I don't know if I any of those yeah. pictures anywhere, but it was just the most random number, number fifty-eight. But it was because of Jonathan Papelbon. I love it. Yeah, you you can't can't forget about that stare. I remember he would he would do like the, <laughs> the lip thing, and and he would look like he wanted to kill you when he was he staring was down for yeah, pitch. No, it was it was sick. I hope you guys did enjoy part one of the Zach Kelly interview. And we're able to learn a little bit about one of the guys down in the Red Sox minor league system that we could potentially see in the major league roster this upcoming season. But make sure to check out tomorrow's episode because we have a part two for you from this interview. Zach is going to be talking about some of his his experiences in the Red Sox organization, some of his favorite players to play with. And he also has some funny stories about Red Sox top prospect, Tristan Castis. Also take a second and go over to Twitter and follow Locked On Red Sox on Twitter. It's LO underscore Red Sox. Because we're going to be getting you guys involved so you guys can ask the questions that you want to in these upcoming player interviews. Also make sure to subscribe on Locked On. Also, make sure to subscribe on whatever audio platform that you are listening to and also on YouTube as well if you like to watch the video version because we have tons of exciting interviews coming up, either with players, reporters, and even though the lockout is going on, Lauren and I still have tons to talk about and people to talk to. But thank you so much for making Locked On Red Sox your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen, Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. It's free and available on all platforms. So definitely go and check that out. Also make sure you follow myself on Twitter at Jake Iggy, as well as my co-host, Nesson writer, Lauren Campbell. It's la, 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 four laws. Lauren with four R's. So go over and follow her. Like I said, make sure to stay tuned on Locked On Red Sox because we have tons of exciting interviews coming up. Thank you so much for all the support. Really do appreciate it. And I will see you guys, talk to you guys tomorrow.